Okay, so in this, our second episode of the investigation into justice, we're going to look at the social contract theories of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Now, I just want to say why we start here. Um, we really could have started anywhere. I mean, the history of thought in the West about these issues goes back to some 500 BC. Um, it really starts with uh, in earnest with Plato's dialogues, uh, particularly the Republic, but also others like the Gorgias um, and uh, the laws. But but um, we're going to start here. And one of the reasons that we start here is just because, well, you have to start somewhere and we can't do everything. So we're going to start here. But another reason that we're starting here is that at this point in history, in the history of ideas, the thoughts that we start seeing theorists expound on are thoughts that we're familiar with. So, for example, the two most important things here is that the thinkers that we look at start talking about things like freedom, the importance of freedom. That's not something that uh, Plato talked much about. He talked about this thing called thumos a lot, which is uh, means spiritedness, or or and it can encapsulate lots of notions like honor and so on. This is a very important notion to the ancient Greeks. You don't hear much about that these days. I mean, you know, when was the last time you heard a political, uh, you know, politician, for example, talking about honor? Um, we we talk about freedom all the time, and this sort of really begins around this period. And the other thing that begins around this period is discussion of individual rights, but the idea that people have uh, individual rights. Um, this is the, a time of the Enlightenment, and that's also uh, a time where ideas come to the fore that are familiar to us. So in the Enlightenment, science starts to become uh, a driver of culture uh, in a way that it wasn't before. And... Um, and scientific ways of thinking about things come to the fore, and we're very much still living in that, uh, in that, with that worldview. Um, there is, however, a very important difference between the way these early Enlightenment figures thought about society and the way that we do. Um, the early Enlightenment figures, figures thought that society would be relatively easy to understand, easier to understand than nature, because society was created by us. So, so the idea basically was this. You know, one might think about it this way. Nature is created, was, you know, according to these thinkers, nature was created by God. And so to understand nature, you really have to understand this aspect of the mind of God. And that may be incredibly difficult or maybe even impossible. Uh, because God creates nature. Right? So to understand nature, you have to understand this aspect of the mind of God. Very, very difficult. Whereas we create society. And so to understand society, all you have to do is understand us. So it ought to be easy to understand, easier to understand society than it is to understand nature. And in the um, textbook, you'll see that uh, Ian Shapiro refers to this as the workmanship model. We don't think this way anymore. <laughs> In fact, as history has shown, it's turned out to be much easier to understand the natural than the social world. So if you think about the developments in the natural sciences, I mean, we've, they've just exploded since this period of time, since the Enlightenment. And um, there have been enormous successes, uh, whereas in the uh, social sciences have made much less progress. So um, we don't buy this workmanship model at all, and that gives us a very different view of society and how it's how it might be understood than uh, the, the people that we're going to begin studying here. Anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. Now, let's then start talking about our two leading thinkers uh, for today, Hobbes and Locke. And first of all, let's just have a look at them. Okay, so here's a, a painting of Thomas Hobbes. And here's one of rather pensive John Locke. Now, we're not actually going to say very much about Hobbes, um, and that makes me a little bit uncomfortable because, in my view, Hobbes is probably the greatest political philosopher ever, which doesn't mean to say he's right about everything. I just think that he, he the questions that he asks, the issues that he raises are so important that he probably deserves the title of the greatest uh, uh, political philosopher ever. So if he is that significant why is it that we aren't studying him more 
And the answer is that this isn't a course on political philosophy proper. This is a course on justice, um, which is just a part of political philosophy. And Hobbes really has no theory of justice. And, and so we can't really study Hobbes in any detail in this, in this course because he doesn't have a theory about what this course is about. We do have to study him in part, though, because we can't really understand John Locke without understanding Thomas Hobbes. Okay, <clears throat> so central to Hobbes's view, central to Hobbes's theory, is this idea of the state of nature. Now, what is the state of nature? Okay, well, what we're asked to do is to imagine a circumstance in which there's no state, there's no government. Like there's no police, there's no uh, universities, there's no parliament, there's no... So there's no organisation, there's no governmental state organisation. Okay, and then Hobbes asks us to imagine what life would be like in such a state. So imagine that we were in a condition in which we were all just left to our own devices. There was no state, there were no laws, there was no police, there's nothing like that, no universities, no... Right. Just, we're just individuals doing their own thing. What would life be like in such, a, in such a circumstance? And Hobbes's answer, famous answer, is that life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Okay, it would be awful. Right? That's his view. And the reason he thinks this is because there would, uh, there are a number of reasons, but basically there would be no industry or security. So the idea, but there wouldn't be any industry. What he means by that is there'd be no point in making anything. There'd be no point in sort of building a house or, or, um, or, or uh, even collecting significant amounts of food because someone could just come along and steal it from you or kick you out of your house or burn it down or whatever it was. So there'd be no point in manufacturing anything, producing anything. And also there'd be no security because there's a kind of logic, he thinks, in this condition that means that everyone would be driven to fight with each other. It's a somewhat complicated and I think rather brilliant idea but uh, that we don't really have time to go into here, but let me just give you the general bare bones of it. Um, Hobbes's idea is basically this. In the state of nature, uh, I know that you pose a threat to me. And the only way that I can prevent that I can eliminate that threat is by attacking you first before you attack me. Um, the problem is that you know exactly the same thing, right? And what's more, I know that you know it. So not only do I have a reason for attacking you before you attack me, I know that you have a reason for attacking me before I attack you. And the fact that I know that gives me yet another reason for attacking you before you attack me. So uh, Hobbes thinks that e even if we're kind of nice people, naturally nice people, we're, you know, we're, we're decent, caring people, the state of nature will drive us into conflict with each other because we're so insecure with respect to everybody else that we're driven to conflict in order to protect ourselves. Now, the solution to this problem, according to Hobbes, the way out of this horrible state of nature is to get together with other people in the society and form the social contract. And the social contract is an agreement in which all of us agree to surrender the natural authority that we have over ourselves to a sovereign who gets to decide what's going to be done, what's not going to be done, what's permissible, what's impermissible, and so on. Right, so we have to give up our natural authority to a sovereign. Only in that way can we avoid the logic of the state of nature that drives us into conflict. And the reason for this is kind of simple. Uh, we'll gain security because the sovereign will provide it. Right? The sovereign will say, you're not allowed to do this, you're, you are allowed to do that. We'll protect you in this way and so on. Okay, now the, a key feature of this position that Hobbes advances is is that under this system, there is no higher law than the law of the sovereign. Now, there may be in some supernatural sense a higher law, maybe, maybe not. But what Hobbes means is that on earth, there's no law higher than the law of the sovereign to which citizens can appeal. Because if there was a higher law than the sovereign, 
effectively we'd be back in the state of nature. If we were able to say, oh yes, the sovereign says that we have to do such and such, but we don't really have to because there's a higher law, well then the sovereign isn't really sovereign, right? We're all individually sovereign over ourselves and that's the state of nature all over again. If we allow there to be, if we allow the idea to take root that there is a higher law that allows people to overrule the commands of the sovereign, then we, we, we will collapse back into the state of nature. And Hobbes's view is that's exactly what happened during the English Civil War. People thought, oh, oh the sovereign, yes, um, I don't have to obey the sovereign's commands because the sovereign's commanding contrary to the laws of God. And so I don't have to obey the sovereign anymore. And the result was a civil war in which, you know, millions, certainly millions of people, many of them in Ireland, died. Um, this is where this idea of a higher law gets you, it gets you civil war. So we have to give up on this idea that there's a higher law than the law of the sovereign, says Hobbes. And this is really why Hobbes doesn't have much to say about the content of this course, because for Hobbes, justice is whatever the sovereign says it is. So that's, you know, that maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but it's not a very interesting theory of justice, right? Just whatever the sovereign says it is. Okay, now Locke, John Locke, was attracted by many of Hobbes' ideas, but he also reacted strongly against some of them. So Hobbes believed uh, in this, that the state of nature was a, a good tool that, to use in working out what the demands of political philosophy are, and Locke agreed with that. He, adopt, he advanced his own social contract argument. But Locke believed, unlike Hobbes, Locke believed that human beings have inalienable rights that the sovereign is not entitled to interfere with. So Locke believed that when we enter into the social contract, we do so in a way that preserves the natural rights that we had before we began so the contracting, as it were. Okay, and here you can see this in this following passage, where Locke says, Political power, then, I take to be a right of making laws with penalties of death and consequently all less penalties for the regulating and preserving of property and of the employing the force of the community in the execution of such laws and the defense of the commonwealth from foreign injury and all this only for the public good. So here immediately we can, we can see that there are constraints on political authority built in to the very concept of political authority as Locke sees it. For Hobbes, there's no constraints on political authority. For, for Locke, there is essentially a constraint on, the, on political authority. Now, you might have noticed in that slide that the quotation is taken from what's called the second treatise. There's the second treatise of government that Locke's, Locke wrote. And that's what we're going to be examining uh, in these lectures. We're going to almost completely ignore the first treatise of government. And you might say, well, why would you ignore the first one and only pay attention to the second one? And the reason for this is that the first treatise is largely a response to uh, uh, views about the divine right of kings, in particular an argument advanced by Robert Filmer, a political philosopher called Robert Filmer, uh, that argued that uh, kings, and in particular the English kings, had a divine right to rule. This is Filmer's argument in a nutshell. God created Adam and God gave authority to Adam to rule over everything like more or less right basically um, and Adam had children and because Adam created those children Adam had authority over them and this authority has been inherited by the kings by the monarchs of Europe Okay, so this was the argument that the, mon the current monarchs of Europe have a divine authority to rule, the divine right, the so-called divine right of kings. They have that authority because they inherited it from Adam. And the result of this, according to Filmer, was that the monarch is above the law. The king is above the law. The king is above the law because the king gets his authority directly from God. Okay, now, this didn't appeal much to Locke 
and he responded to it in the first treatise. And he argues that it is correct to say that people have absolute authority over what they create. That's essentially his theory of property. People have absolute authority over things that they create. But, says Locke, human beings are not created by other human beings. Parents do not create their children, for example, so parents do not have absolute authority over their children. Instead, Locke argues God creates children, and the parents are just the tool that God uses to create children. And so it follows from this, according to Locke, that uh, people are not owned by anybody. They are all, Locke says, naturally equal. As children of God, if these, these ideas, you know, you hear all the time these days. But as children of God, they're all naturally equal. We are all God's creations, says Locke, and kings and commoners and, and all of us. Okay, and you see this idea appearing again and again in Locke. Because we're all created by God, Locke says, we have natural rights that the sovereign can't take away from us. So in summary... According to Locke, all human beings are God's creations. They are the property of God and not the property of anybody else. You own what you create, but parents do not create their children. Thus, people, all people are naturally equal. Now, Locke applies these ideas in the secondary test to the state of nature argument. So imagine now a state of nature. Locke describes the state of nature as a state of absolute equality, right? We're all, in the state of nature, we're all God's children. We all have exactly the same rights and entitlements, authorities, and so on. We're all the same. So Locke tells us that, but though this be a state of liberty, yet it is not a state of license. Though man in that state have an uncontrollable liberty to dispose of his personal possessions, yet he has not liberty to destroy himself, or so much as any creature in his possession, but where some nobler use than its bare preservation calls for it. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone and reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty or possessions, for men being all the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, all the servants of one sovereign master, sent into the world by his order and about his business, they are his property, whose workmanship they are made to last during his, not one another's pleasure. Okay, so some things to notice about this very important passage. The first thing is that Locke says that the state of nature is not a state of license. We compare that with Hobbes. For Hobbes, there was, there's no rules in the state of nature. You just, you're at your own, you're at your own authority. You're, you are your own authority. Okay. And, but Locke says, no, that's not right. There's, there's not a state of license. There are rules that exist in the state of nature. Now, there's no one there to enforce the rules. Okay, and that's a problem. But nevertheless, there are rules that exist. Uh, the second thing is that, um, as we've just seen, there is law in the state of nature. And this is why Hobbes, uh, Locke is said to advance a natural law theory. There is law in nature. In the state of nature, there is law. And that law is the result of the equality of persons, the moral equality of persons. There are rights in the state of nature that need protection, that demand protection, even though there's no one there to do the protecting. Um, <clears throat> rights to life, rights to health, rights to liberty, and rights to possessions. Now, these rights, according to Locke, are founded on an obligation that we owe to God. I think this aspect of Locke's theory is often passed over. Uh, but anyway, it's clearly there, and you can see it in this passage. Uh, this obligation, the obligation to God, generates an obligation to preserve one's own life and to best utilise one's own property. So uh, Locke thinks that you have a right to property, but you, act, you have an obligation that goes along with that right to utilise that property in the best way. So there's freedom on earth. That's a big part of Locke's Theory, freedom, is a big part of Locke's theory, but it's connected with an obligation to the divine that also is supposed to echo on earth. Um, and 
this has a res resounding consequence, as we'll see in a future episode. But the key thing to see is, that in Locke's view, the state of nature is not nearly as miserable as Hobbes thought. The state of nature is not perfect. It needs to be improved on. But it's already got the seeds of a well-organized well organized society already there. All right, that's enough of the state of nature. In the next episode, we'll dig further into Locke's theory.